Joining us now is Patrick Habamenchi. He is the founder of a social enterprise group called Behind Dogon Doors and is a native of Rwanda, and we welcome you to TVO. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. In a way, I think, Patrick, we're going to have two conversations today about this topic because there is, uh, from your native land, obviously, before the genocide and after the genocide, yeah. and things changed so much after. Mm -hmm. Let's start with before the genocide. We're going to go back to before 1994. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about how the elderly were traditionally treated in Rwanda before the genocide. Well, before the genocide, um, the elderly were really uh, respected in society. Like families would take care of their elders. And uh, even if you didn't have close relatives, there would always be somebody around, some distant relative, some friend to, to help you with the errands, the food, everything. Was it a tradition then for older people, say parents or grandparents, to move in with their children when they got past the point where they could take care of themselves? Absolutely. It's, uh, sometimes you would see elders living on their own, but then the families would send somebody to live with them. Maybe a grandkid, uh, maybe um, one of the kids would move, stay with the parents, or they would move in and stay with one of the families. So it's a, it's a tradi it's a it's part of the culture. Tell me more about this. Where did this, um, where did this notion in the Rwandan culture come from, that responsibility to one's elders was an important thing to do? Uh, well, it's the way we are raised. Ever since you're a kid, you know that you, your parents, your grandparents are taking care of you, and at some point you will have to do the same for them. So it's really much in the way we are raised, and it's also that belief that we are all uh, interconnected and we all depend on each other in general, mm -hmm. like in life. We just showed a map of Rwanda, and I gather you're from the northern part of the country? Yes. I don't, is that an important distinction to make? They do things differently in the north from the south? Well, um, family relations are different across the country. It's a small country, mm -hmm. but still uh, we have um, different ways of interacting uh, with each other. And in the northern part of Rwanda, in Giseni, where I come from, there's uh, the, even this tradition of uh, people sending one of their kids to stay with the parent, their grandparents. And uh, that's something actually so normal that the kid doesn't even f doesn't feel ostracized, ostracized to be sent to live with their grandparents. It's a, it's an honor to be to staying with them and taking care of everything. So and they would move in with their grandparents permanently. Oh yeah, and they would be raised by their grandparents. They would know that they have their own parents, and they would go and stay with their parents from time to time. But they would stay with their grandparents, be like their own child. So the grandparents always have somebody young around them. Huh, that's very yeah. different. Now, why, how, why do they do that? Is it to take <laughs> care of the grandparents? It's, to, it's, to, it's for the grandparents to have somebody with them and a young presence. As a, it probably comes from the, the belief that the mind stays young when you are surrounded by younger people. Hmm. And for the kid, it's also good because they benefit from the wisdom of the grandparents. So it's a, it's a sort of exchange. And um, in a way, it brings about more responsibility. Mm -hmm. You grow up knowing that you have to be responsible in society. And there's no sense of, um, I don't want to do this, or you know, why me, send my brother or send my sister? You don't experience that in the culture? No, because a lot of times the younger kids love their grandparents. And I'm sure that when you live with your grand grandparents, they will let you get away with more things than your own parents. <laughs> so there so are advantages there to There are advantages. In. I mean, yeah. But people don't question that. Like, the kids don't, don't question that. They know it's, it's part of what you do. Now, admittedly, you've been here in Canada 14, 15 years now? Yes. Have you heard of such an arrangement taking place in this country? Uh, no. No, I haven't either. I just <laughs> want to really check. Not no. Maybe I'm missing something. All right. <laughs> Okay, how did this spending time with and caring for the elderly affect the way that Rwandans view death? Um, in Rwanda, uh, at least before the, the, the war and genocide, death was part of life. You live for a certain time and then you, you pass away. And you, we all accept the fact that at some point people will leave us. And living with um, the elderly helps us also see that um, the end coming. 
It's not like when you're not living with them and you're not, you don't know what is going on in their daily life, you might be taken by surprise by the fact that at some point they are ill and then they, they pass away. But if you live with them every day, you'd see the changes in them. You know what is happening and you, you get used to, to the fact that at some point aging would lead to something else. It, death is more difficult to accept when it's a younger person who dies. Mm -hmm. Like young people, kids, uh, they usually will die in an accident or of illness. That's more difficult to accept because we are not prepared to it. But so fun, it, yeah. a greater understanding that as simple as it and obvious as it is to say that death is a part of life. Death is a part of life. Nobody lives forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course you are, you are grateful when you have uh, your close relatives, your elders living as long as it is possible. Mm -hmm. you're, you're blessed, but when it comes, um, you, you accept that that's, that's a part of it. And actually when somebody dies, people gather with the family to talk about the good things they remember. People try not to cry when somebody dies. Of course, emotions can take you over and you're gonna cry, sure. but you will try to remember all the good things. So people are laughing and telling jokes and remembering the good things that were, that were um, part of that person's life, not the tragedy, not the loss. I understand. Okay, let's do, um, let's do a bit of a comparison here. All right, so that's the way it, w it was in Rwanda before the genocide. You've now been in Canada 14, 15 years. You've seen the way the elderly are treated in this society. Mm -hmm. How would you compare? Uh, it's very different. Like the, I remember my first years here, I was always uh, f feeling um, kind of um, sad when I look at uh, the way um, elderly people are treated. Because, I mean, you see um, all the facilities are there. That's great. The, seniors can get access to so many different things that back home people wouldn't get access to. At the same time, I feel that seniors are living on their own. They live in a class on it, uh, on, uh, of its own, and uh, there's a, a sense of loneliness. Maybe I sense that, that loneliness, and maybe it's not there, but I feel like it, it's, it's lonely to know that at some point in life, your, your family will put you somewhere where you can go and age, but still away from them. Do you see the same respect for elderly people that you saw back in Rwanda? It's a different type of respect. It's more, um, here people will focus much more on what society can do for the elders. And we're gonna fight for that, and we're gonna make sure that there's um, the health care, the right uh, secu uh, social security and everything for them. But the at the individual level, at the family level, there's a detachment. And it's also accepted that at some point, you will no longer be living with your elders and you might not even see them and it's fine. Uh, whereas for us, it's not fine to go on days and days and months without seeing your <laughs> elders. It, it's, it's kind of strange. Another comparison, you told us how traditional Rwandan society viewed death. Mm -hmm. How about over here? What, what do you see as being our attitude towards death? I always sense that death is a very uh, traumatic event. Traumatic. Yeah. yeah. You will, uh, it's almost like we're so used to people being healthy and uh, for people living very long lives that we are shocked when somebody die, hmm. dies. And uh, we, we have a hard time coming to terms with that occurrence, which is a normal occurrence, but we, I, we see people living till they are 80 or 90 or, or 100, and we think that they're gonna live forever, but that's impossible. Mm -hmm. So we have to live with that, uh, knowing that it will happen. And you even see that when people are ill, the families will not understand if somebody says, I cannot fight anymore, I have to. Mm -hmm. This is the end for me, and people will not accept that. You see, you have to keep fighting, you have to stay. We have to, to put ourselves in a, in a different way. We have to look at death differently and, and accept that it's part of life. How old are you, Patrick, if I can ask? I'm 41. 41. So yeah. you're many, many, many years away from having to worry about dying <laughs> yourself. God willing, yes. <laughs> but given what you've told us and the way that you have seen people in this society treat the elderly, does it make you ever think to yourself, maybe I'm going to go back to Rwanda when I get into my senior years because they seem to treat their elderly better there? Um, well, it does cross my mind, to tell you the truth. Uh, 
not necessarily thinking uh, in terms of let me go in, uh, and live somewhere else, but it's more how do I prepare myself to what I see here. If I am to age in Canada, how will I deal with that? I have, I'd start thinking about it. Not necessarily that it's not going to happen tomorrow or the day after, but I start, it, it crosses my mind when I see, especially when I see um, elderly people on the street or trying to carry uh, their grocery bags on their own or uh, doing all sorts of things on their own. I'm asking myself, will I be able to go on if I have to, to live like that? Uh, now, Going somewhere else could be um, a possibility, but at the same time, I evolve with this society, so I don't know how much I would be uh, ready to go and live in another setting. And it's a long now way away, I'm, after all. Yeah, it's a long hopefully. way. And it's, it's, yeah. I don't <laughs> mean the distance, of years. I mean years. That's right, <laughs> yeah, in terms hopefully. of years, hopefully. hopefully. All right, we, in our conversation earlier, we talked about pre-1994 Rwanda. The genocide happens in 1994, and now I want to get a better understanding of how all of what we've talked about has changed since then. So let's talk about how the genocide has changed, uh, the attitude of young people towards the elderly in Rwanda today. Mm -hmm. Any differences? Yes, there are some. Um, of course, one of the main things that happened during the genocide is that so many people died at the same time in a very short period of time. And even after the genocide in the refugee camps, so many people died. And it became suddenly the main thing that uh, was going on in our lives. People were losing uh, relatives every day. And death became something that can sneak up on you. Whereas before, it was more something that you you, you're going to leave for a certain time, and then it's going to happen one day. Now it, it has changed our sense of uh, death and life in a way that now you know that nothing is granted. You know that death can come abruptly, and everything can change in a split second. You know that even younger people can die. Even babies can die. You are, it's, part of, it's not that you are, we are accepting that fact, but we know it's a reality. It affects we, your whole world view, I guess. It, it affects your whole world view because you start, I know for many, uh, the genocide was, was 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I feel like we've started living more in a short term type of, um, the way we look at the world, we are looking at very short term goals. Uh, we, we are not back to that point where you look at many years in front of you. You are, you are blessed when you go through one day and then another day and then a year and then another year. And we count the years and, and it all become, it seems to be like the same event but going, you know. So because uh, of the genocide, you, you're not confident tomorrow will be there. So you don't you, make the longer range plans. Yeah, you, it's, it, you don't consciously do it. But when you think about it, you realize that a lot of us has, have changed the way we look at um, our own mm -hmm. lives. And now, in terms of how we deal with, with um, a people aging in our society, it's very different because family settings have completely changed. With so many people dead, uh, a lot of families that were going to rely on lots of siblings and cousins and and relatives to take care of the elders now have very few people. And a lot of people are forced to take care just of their immediate family and not have room to take care of. Has the people. Rwandan government addressed this in any way in an attempt to kind of repair the, the basic family unit or the social system, that kind of thing? It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. It takes a lot of means, and uh, the government doesn't have that type of money. After the genocide, what the government has tried to do is to uh, deal with health care issues for the survivors, uh, school, like making sure that all the orphans are able to go in school and pay uh, their tuition and what. Now, in terms of the family setting, is more the families are left to themselves to deal with that. Mm. It's fortunate that still society, people still understand that you have to take care of other people. So if you have something extra, you're going to take a bag of rice to a relative. Uh, you're going to give some money to somebody in your family or somebody that you know 
who's living on their own. So the dynamics are changing and people are trying to adapt, mm -hmm. but it's uh, far from the way it was before the tragedy. Let me ask you one last thing, Patrick, and that is you told us before that uh, Rwandans had a better understanding perhaps the North Americans, that death was all a part of life and they seem to have a healthier attitude about it. Since the genocide, can you still say that that is true? Um, actually, now we have, it's even more, it has extended to more people. Like before we were used that you will age and then die or if there's an accident or if there's an illness, you're gonna die younger. Now anybody can die. And you live with that reality that even you can die. And you don't know what you're going to die of. I remember when I was looking at the earthquake in uh, Haiti overnight, in a split second, everybody, so many people lost their lives, so many people lost their relatives. So we live with that type of understanding that nothing is granted. Maybe you appreciate life a little bit more, and you try not to get trapped in that fear that you're going to die, but you accept that. It might occur even in the best conditions in the world. Something can happen and you lose everything in a split second. Patrick, it's awfully good of you to come into TVO tonight and share your views on this. Thanks so much for helping us out. Thank you for having me here. Thank you.